Okay. A very good evening to all of you who have joined in today yet again for another invigorating talk. And this time we have the wonderful Stephen Alter, who has authored numerous fiction and nonfiction books. Um, he was born in Missouri, Uttarakhand, and much of his writing, and that is a big, big plus for us that it focuses on the Himalayan region. Um, his latest book, uh, Wild Himalayas, which is on my shelf in the Himalayan Institute, is a natural history of the greatest mountain range on earth. Uh, his most recent work on nonfiction also received the 2020 Banff Mountain Book Award in the Mountain Environment and Natural History category. Uh, Becoming a Mountain is another book he authored, uh, Himalayan Journeys in Search of the Sacred and Sublime, and it received the Keku Narauji Award for Himalayan Literature. In the Jungles of the Night, another novel about Jim Corbett is his latest work of fiction, which was shortlisted for the DSC South Asian Literature Award. The Cloudfarers is his most recent book for young readers. He has written extensively on natural history, folklore and mountain culture, particularly in his travel memoir, Sacred Waters, a pilgrimage to the many sources of the Ganga. He was, as we all know now, educated at Woodstock School and the Vizalin University. After he uh, taught at the American University in Cairo, Egypt. And this was particularly uh, very, very close to my heart because I have uh, worked in Egypt for a decade. And I do not know whether you know Salima Ikram, who's very, very close to me. I know her name, certainly. certainly. Yeah, I'm... so yeah, she's still at the American University in Cairo. So um, I would love to know how your experience was there. Um, he was the director of the writing program for seven years there, and then a writer in residence at MIT for 10 years, where he taught courses in creative writing. Among the honors he's received are fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the Fulbright Program, the East West Center in Hawaii, and the Band Center for Mountain Culture. He's also the director, founding director of the Missouri Mountain Festival. And all of you who are interested in knowing about Stephen and wish to follow his work and anything that is in store for all of us in the future, please do go to www.stephenalter.net and I'll post that link eventually in the talk as well. So Stephen, over to you. And before you uh, start your talk for today, and I'm delighted that you're here, I would urge everybody to please mute their mics and put their videos off. And after the talk is over, you can please show us your uh, faces again. Uh, so uh, Stephen, over to you, please. Well, uh, thank you very much, Sonali, and thank you to the Himalayan Institute for inviting me uh, for this talk. It's it's a real pleasure. Of course, I wish I wish we could just meet in person. Uh, that would be uh, a much more, I think, uh, productive and personable uh, interaction. But nevertheless, here we are. We're online, and uh, we're going to talk about the Himalaya. Um, as as Sonali said, I I was born in the Himalaya. Uh, I was raised in the Himalaya, and I continue to live in the Himalaya, and this is my home. Uh, as I've written in my book, I, I consider myself an endemic species. Tonight, I'll, I'll be talking about uh, some of the narratives, some of the stories that emerge out of uh, the Himalaya, uh, those that, um, in a sense, underscore the legacy, the heritage, of, of our Himalayan um, landscape. And uh, I'll be talking about my most recent book, Wild Himalaya, but also, uh, as Sonali mentioned, uh, Becoming a Mountain and Sacred Waters. Um, I'll also be drawing upon, over the last 10, 15 years, uh, inspiration, information, um, ideas that have come out of the Missouri Mountain Festival, uh, which has brought more than 150 to 200 uh, mountain writers, uh, enthusiasts, adventurers, artists, musicians, uh, and uh, environmental activists to Missouri. So all of that is, in a sense, the background from which I'm speaking. Uh, one of the things that 
is very important to understand is that most people, when they think of the Himalaya, they think of the Himalaya as this eternal, immutable, unchanging landscape, that it's somehow this uh, static range of mountains that are spread out in front of us. And part of the reason we think about it in that way is that most of us look at the Himalaya from a distance. Uh, we might be standing in Shimla, we might be uh, standing in Darjeeling, we might be standing in Masuri, and we look up at those high mountains and we see them from a distance and they look to us as something that is unchanging, uh, is uh, static in a sense uh, throughout history. The reason we do that uh, in some regards is because of the perspective that we're given through the lens of mountaineering. Mountaineers, people who climb to the summits of these peaks, uh, often uh, disregard everything that is below 6,000 meters. And they're simply looking at those pinnacles of rock and snow and ice that are up there. Everything that is in a sense above the level of living creatures, living species uh, in the Himalaya. Uh, the other reason we tend to look at those mountains as immutable and unchanging is because we look at it through the lens of spirituality. We look at it through a religious perspective that in a sense refers to the Himalaya as the abode of the gods, this place where uh, myths become reality, where uh, the great heroes of the epics uh, the gods and sometimes even the demons of our uh, various religious traditions exist, uh, continue to inhabit this, this world. And so it becomes a sort of timeless landscape, a landscape that in a sense is outside the uh, world that we inhabit, where things do change, where things are rapidly changing in so many ways. But what I would like to put before you today and what I'd like to talk about really is that instead of being this static landscape, the Himalaya really are a living landscape, a landscape in which things are constantly changing. They are constantly in flux um, and they are perpetually uh, adjusting themselves to uh, various forces uh, that uh, are at play in the Himalaya. Um, one of the forces, of course, that most of us are familiar with is geological change. Uh, the rocks within the Himalaya are moving. Uh, these mountains are not set in stone. Instead, those stones are moving. Those stones are rubbing against each other. Those stones are pushing one up above the other. And the Himalaya we are told by geologists, are still growing several centimeters a year. So we must realize that, first of all, that rocks, when we say something is set in stone, we tend to suggest that it is forever. Uh, but in a sense, these stones themselves are moving, and we must understand that, first of all. Uh, the second thing is that there is an enormous amount of meteorological change. We talk today about climate change, that's, that's at the top of everybody's list today. But there is so much that is related to the meteorology of the Himalaya that is constantly in flux, uh, whether it is the seasons, uh, whether it is monsoon uh, showers, downpours, thunderstorms, whatever it may be. Uh, there is no day in the Himalaya that is the same as the day before. Uh, though these days in October, I'm speaking from Missouri, it tends to be a wonderful repetition of sun uh, all day long. But uh, most of the year in the Himalaya, one day is very different from the other uh, because of the weather, because of the temperature, because of the uh, humidity, uh, and because of the uh, precipitation. Uh, there's also, of course, hydrological change. Uh, the rivers, uh, the wetlands in the Himalaya, uh, which are, of course, a result of uh, the meteorology and the geology of that 
this region, uh, th th there is constant change. I remember if anyone who has camped next to a river in the Himalaya will know that uh, in the morning, uh, you may have a higher level of water, and then by afternoon, it will have receded, and then by evening, it will uh, increase again, simply because that river reflects the snow melt uh, at its sources. So rivers, rivers are not constant. We often like to think of them as constant, but they, they are changing. And so are wetlands also. They advance and they recede in many ways. There is also, of course, biological change. And biological change is perhaps the most dramatic uh, in the sense that you see different species asserting uh, their predominance over other species. You see uh, species moving between one area of the Himalaya and the other. Uh, we see life, in a sense, in all its diversity. When we talk about biodiversity, we think of it as this enormous list of different species. But I think biodiversity is also, very importantly, something where the interaction between different species creates this wonderful dynamic uh, that is part of life in the Himalaya. And so whether it's a bird, whether it's a mammal, whether it's a tree, whether it's a plant, all of these different species are interacting with each other. And they are, in a sense, that interaction is part of that dynamic that is very much a part of the Himalaya. Uh, the other thing that I think is vital to understand is that there is enormous cultural change. When we talk about our species, the human species, which inhabit the Himalaya, there is an enormous amount of change there as well. We can look through history to the uh, variety of communities that lived in the Himalaya. We can look at the way in which they migrated, uh, the way in which they sustained themselves uh, through the use of forest resources as they moved up to higher altitudes and moved to lower altitudes. And then also the idea that cultures uh, within the Himalaya uh, define themselves very distinctly from others. One of the things about the Himalaya that is, I think, fascinating is the fact that uh, there are different bands of habitation within the Himalaya. And each of those bands of habitation, whether it's from the lowlands to the highlands, has its own culture and its own traditions and often its own language. And then as you move uh, across, uh, vertic uh, horizontally across the Himalaya, each of the uh, uh, valleys that are there and the ridge lines divide people into different uh, cultural communities, uh, different linguistic groups. Uh, and uh, that's one of the fascinating things about the Himalaya. There's, there is very little homogeneity in these mountains. And so human beings also reflect that diversity uh, that is there and that level of change that is there. So let's for a moment uh, put aside that idea that these mountains are eternal, that these mountains are forever, that these mountains are unchanging, and think of them instead as a landscape that is perpetually in flux, perpetually moving, perpetually um, changing its own uh, physical aspect as well as the uh, stories and um, uh, uh, narratives that are embedded within that landscape. And I often think we, in uh, India, we talk about the ocean of stories. Uh, that is perhaps the most uh, powerful metaphor we have for that vast reservoir of uh, narratives that we all draw upon. Uh, in folklore, in mythology, in um, uh, other narrative traditions as well. But I also, I, I, I often think that instead of calling it an ocean of stories, at least in the Himalayan context, we should think of it as a mountain range of stories. And that the Himalaya itself, I have often thought of as a living library of stories. If you look at the panorama of the Himalaya, whether you look at it from Shimla, whether you look at it from Darjeeling, or whether you look at it from Kashmir or Anurantral Pradesh, there is that panorama in front of you. And if you imagine those mountains to be, in a sense, a vast bookshelf 
of volumes. It's a huge text in a sense that we can draw upon as writers, as storytellers, as readers, as observers of the Himalaya. And uh, it's, it's in a sense a limitless library of stories. Um, of course, there are many, many published sources. And as a writer, I draw upon those uh, time and time again. There are so many books that have been published about the Himalaya that are available to me as resources, as reference books uh, in uh, so many ways. There are so many journals on my shelf. I have the Himalayan journal, which takes up uh, a good deal of space. And throughout that Himalayan journal, there are stories, there are uh, commentaries, there are uh, reports of expeditions, of exploration, and so on. And all of this is something that I draw from. So I, I look at the Himalaya as a, a vast library from which I can draw upon uh, for so many stories. Now, the, uh, in addition to the published work, there is a far larger body of uh, narratives, which is part of the oral tradition of the Himalaya. And anywhere you go within the uh, Himalaya, you will encounter uh, stories that are told on many different levels, at many different layers of uh, narrative. There are, of course, the myths. And many of these myths are pan-Indian myths that uh, have, in a sense, migrated up to the Himalaya and have uh, asserted their presence in these mountains. Some of these myths come from the epics, uh, the Mahabharat, uh, the Ramayan. And uh, if you uh, go to a place like Tungnath, for instance, you will see uh, uh, various spots and places where uh, episodes uh, from the Ramayan, for instance, uh, are uh, identified and, and located uh, in those mountains. Uh, from the Mahabharat, you will also find many places that are associated with the heroes of the Mahabharat, the Pandavas, uh, in their journeys following the great battle at, at Kurukshetra. Um, the uh, mountains have various cultures that celebrate these myths uh, and these epics in Garhwal, uh, here we have the Pandav Leela tradition in which stories of the Pandavas are reenacted in village uh, communities, uh, retelling episodes uh, of uh, the, the Pandavas' adventures, uh, sometimes here in the Himalaya at other times uh, before they ascended into the Himalaya on their way uh, to uh, heaven. Um, there are also a, a number of devotional songs, uh, devotional songs to goddesses like uh, Nanda Devi, uh, to other deities that are there. And these devotional songs also represent another level of uh, revisiting, retelling uh, those myths uh, in a devotional uh, setting. On top of that, there is also a very rich load of uh, folklore. And that folklore, uh, and here I'll distinguish it in a sense from the mythology, though it, it blurs and, and, and crosses those boundaries uh, at all times. But the folklore, in a sense, often takes the stories of heroes, local heroes, uh, kings, uh, courtiers, who are celebrated uh, through the storytelling of bards and and singers. Um, we uh, have a number of those stories here in, in Garhwal, and they, in a sense, celebrate this sort of heroic history that is somewhere uh, between folklore and, and myth. Um, the folk songs that are sung to those are still sung, and contemporary singers uh, in Garhwal and Kumao uh, provide new renditions of those songs and in a sense, continue those stories and push them forward in that way. Folk theater in uh, many of the villages also retells, revisits uh, those stories and you have masked dances. Uh, my dear friend, uh, Dr. Barohit, Dr. Barohit has documented many of these uh, stories uh, that are performed uh, in the villages of 
uh, Garhwal. And um, it, it's a fascinating uh, uh, sort of montage of narratives that come together uh, in that way. In addition to that, uh, for me, as I was writing these books, uh, what I drew upon was what I call scientific lore. Uh, there are obviously a huge number of books that have been written and articles that have been written about uh, the natural history, the science, uh, the geology, the uh, uh, ornithology, the zoology of the Himalayas. And what, what I think we tend to forget is we usually think of science as being this very dry, um, academic uh, subject that, or series of subjects that uh, we, in a sense, can get information from, but there's not much entertainment in that. But in fact, if you start reading some of that scientific lore, uh, if you start reading the accounts of scientists who have studied the geology or the um, botany of the Himalaya, whether it's uh, Dian Wadia, uh, the great uh, geologist who, who studied the um, uh, the the uh, uh, rocks and the rock formations in Kashmir, or you're talking about J.D. Hooker, who studied the uh, everything from the rhododendrons to uh, the ferns of Sikkim. Uh, within buried within those accounts is is some wonderful uh, storytelling as well. I, I often the the one example I often give is. Um, Frank Kinden Ward, uh, an early plant hunter, uh, botanist, who entered the Himalaya from China. Right? And most people uh, entered the Himalaya through India. Uh, Kingdon Ward came uh, through uh, China, and in the, this was in the early uh, 1920s and 30s. And uh, he describes, first of all, discovering or uh, finding the blue poppy, which is this wonderfully exotic and beautiful Himalayan plant. And during the course of that expedition, he also describes how uh, he was camped in the high Himalaya and there was an earthquake. And he describes how after the earthquake, he realized that his tent had been lifted 25 uh, meters higher than where it was pitched originally. And stories like that give you a sense of that dynamic force that is there in the Himalaya, the fact that nothing is stable. Nothing is stable, nothing is predictable. You'd never know what you're going to find, whether it's a blue poppy or uh, an earthquake uh, on your way. Um, if I was to pick one story or one set of stories, and I'll use a term that I don't usually use, which is a trope. Uh, it's, it's one of those uh, words that's used in... Uh, comparative literature departments and English departments. And I've always avoided it because it, 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 it never seemed to quite satisfy my sense of what uh, narratives are. But nevertheless, if we take this trope, uh, which is migration, and we talk about migration in the Himalaya, migration is something that crosses every discipline. Uh, it crosses every uh, form of research exploration, observation, or artistic uh, expression in the Himalaya. And migration, I think, is something that is key to understanding the uh, ge ge geography of the Himalaya, but also the culture of the Himalaya. I spoke earlier about geological change. And it's interesting and important to think of those rocks migrating. We talk about the continents colliding coming together, uh, crushing up against each other, pushing rocks up uh, as high as 8,000 uh, meters, eight kilometers up into the sky. And all of that is in a sense, a geological migration. It's a movement uh, of rock, uh, soil uh, and minerals that come together and then push up to form uh, the Himalaya. I spoke about uh, meteorological change. But it's important, I think, to understand that in a sense, something like the monsoon is a migration. It is a movement. It is a journey in a sense where the vast amounts of moisture uh, collect over uh, the Indian Ocean, over the Bay of Bengal, 
over the Arabian Sea. And these rafts of moisture then travel across uh, the subcontinent of India until they collide with the Himalaya and release that moisture uh, as precipitation as rain or snow uh, or hail and it falls upon those mountains. And literally the water itself, the moisture from the oceans is migrating to the hills. And then of course it flows off the mountains and it migrates uh, down as rivers. Uh, and so the rivers themselves carry that moisture uh, down to the plains and back to the sea. So it is this cycle of migration that occurs uh, not in a living form, but in a meteorological or a climatic uh, form in that way. Uh, the rivers, of course, are a wonderful source of metaphor for storytellers. Uh, we think of stories themselves as rivers. We think of the flow of the river as being something that is, in a sense, a uh, representation, can be represented as uh, uh, life itself. A, uh, it has a beginning, it has an end, and yet it is eternal and it continues uh, forever. So those metaphors, I think, get used often, but there are many other metaphors in there. I, I love the word tributary. Tributary is one of those words that uh, has all sorts of meanings. I mean, does it, do you offer tribute to someone? Uh, do you contribute to something? Uh, all of those uh, associations with that word are there. And yet the tributaries of the Ganga are uh, an important part of the uh, uh, ge geography of the Himalaya, but also the hydrology and the hydrology, that sacred hydrology that we associate with the Ganga. Um, there are so many uh, metaphors that we uh, can uh, associate with the Ganga. I mean, the wonderful story of the... Uh, the descent of the Ganga, which is there in the mythology of Hindu mythology associated with King Bhagirath, who does his penance uh, and uh, tapasya for uh, thousands and thousands of years, and finally persuades Ganga to come down from the heavens. Uh, and as she descends, in order to protect the earth from the force of her descent, uh, it, she falls in Lord Shiv's. Uh, dreadlocks and then flows out into the mountains and then out into the plains. It's, it's a wonderful metaphor that uh, recalls uh, many of the things that scientists have observed in terms of the, that, that force of the monsoon that creates so much erosion that, uh, and we've seen the devastating effects of uh, the Ganga's force in very recent years in the way it has washed away uh, everything from hydroelectric dams to hotels to uh, human dwellings. And uh, if you look back at that myth, uh, you can make those associations as well. Another myth that I think is, is, is fascinating and is of great use to us who are environmentalists, people who are concerned about uh, the uh, Himalayan environment is, uh, is the myth of Saraswati, that river uh, th that no longer exists. Uh, Saraswati, uh, at least in Hindu scriptures, is described as one of the great rivers of the Himalaya. But we don't know where this river now flows. Has it gone underground? Has it ascended back uh, into the heavens? We don't know. Uh, there's some uh, geological evidence that it uh, once flowed across Haryana and off into Gujarat and elsewhere there are satellite photos that show us uh, the riverbeds uh, that once existed but it's hard to hard to know actually where uh, where the Saraswati has gone but it's a very potent metaphor it's a metaphor that we can use because when people think that the Himalaya are eternal they often think that the rivers of the Himalaya are eternal. And in fact, they are not. Uh, with climate change, with uh, the deforestation, with so many of the forces that are opposed to that natural environment, uh, the rivers are being depleted. Ice itself is being depleted. And uh, the glaciers are receding. Um, and at someday, 
if we're not careful, if we are not responsible, then these rivers will disappear. The Ganga will disappear just as the Saraswati disappeared. So it's, it's in a sense, in a, as a storyteller, you want to be able to use those uh, metaphors and uh, use them to underscore uh, an ecological uh, environmental problem. Um, I think that uh, I mentioned the glaciers, and I think I, I, I won't take a lot of time on that, but it is very important to river, uh, realize that these rivers of ice that are there are in motion. They are in motion. They are not quite uh, uh, as fast as our eye can catch uh, compared to our daily lives. They are moving in absolutely slow motion, but compared to the geological migration that has been happening, uh, the glaciers are moving at rocket speed, and uh, they are also being depleted at a very rapid rate. So the glaciers too, uh, I think, represent uh, the, the change, uh, the uh, deterioration, the erosion uh, of the Himalaya. Now, the biological mi migration is one that perhaps most of us are familiar with, and we think about migration in terms of uh, living species, but we probably don't often think of migration as something associated with botany, uh, with plants and shrubs and trees in that way. But if you look at the Himalaya, if you look at the history of the Himalaya, uh, the fact is that uh, about 10,000 years ago, the last ice age ended and the snow caps, the glaciers, the um, uh, frozen uh, expanse of the Himalaya began to recede. And as it receded, the plants and other species that were once there, some of them very primitive, mosses uh, 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 and other early uh, species of uh, plant life, uh, 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 some of the warts and other uh, species like that, began to reclaim their territory as the ice moved up. And uh, behind them came other species of plants that moved up these lateral valleys and reoccupied terrain that had been uh, covered with ice. And that movement, that, that progression of uh, botanical sub, uh, species is absolutely vital to understanding the way in which the Himalaya are a living landscape. And it wasn't uh, a straightforward, uh, continuous progression. Over the last 10,000 years, there have been some many ice ages that have occurred. Uh, some of these plants and other species have retreated, and then they've moved back. But what I would like to convey to you, and what I think is most important, is to really think of botanical species moving forward. And, and if we look at trees, for instance, um, uh, the, the tree that I often think of most often is the uh, birch, uh, uh, Betula utilis, uh, the Himalayan birch, which um, when, when I trekked through the Himalayas for many years, I used to think of the birch as being the first spe uh, being the last species. Uh, as I climbed up to the tree line, the last species I encountered of tree was the birch. And uh, I used to think that beyond that, then of course, you went above the tree line, you found a few plants, and then of course you hit the snow line and there was no life after that. But I've had to re think that whole idea. And I now think of the birch uh, as being the first species, not the last, but the first. It is the one that leads the way. The birches are the ones that populate the higher elevations before all others. They are followed by conifers. They are followed by deciduous species like oaks um, and uh, maples and other species like that. And uh, if you begin to think of these, these trees in a sense, of course, each single tree is rooted to one place, but as it procreates, as it spreads its seeds, it moves further upward. And you can almost imagine that march of trees uh, heading up into the higher Himalaya. There are so many other migrations, of course. There are insects of all kinds that migrate. Uh, one of the fascinating uh, uh, images that uh, Dr. Uh, Gopal Ravid, GR, uh, 
Rabat, who is a, a, one of the fo foremost experts on Himalayan botany, explained to me one time was, you know, when the, when the birch uh, flowers or the calyx appears on that, a number of insects then uh, come to feed on that calyx to, to get nectar and other uh, nutrients from that calyx. And then the um, leaf warblers, small birds, tiny birds, they arrive to feed on those insects. So the, the progression of species moving upward, uh, led by the birches, doesn't limit itself to botanical species. It includes all kinds of insects, and then the birds that follow those insects, and, and so on and so forth. So it, 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 the biodiversity, as I said before, is not something that is just a list. In fact, it is an interactive, uh, um, uh, living landscape, and we must look at it as that. Um, the migration of birds is something that I think most people think of when they think of the Himalaya, and uh, migration is generally associated with all kinds of species of birds. But um, there are wonderful stories about a species like uh, the bar-headed goose, which travels across the Himalayas twice a year. It breeds and nests in uh, central Tibet, in wetlands there, and then it crosses uh, at the uh, end of summer uh, into the subcontinent of India, and it uh, is found as far south as uh, places in Mysore and Kerala. And then uh, in the spring, it returns across the Himalayas. And there is this migration that takes place uh, that is, is really a profound story of uh, a species that is moving between different environments and crossing this formidable uh, barrier of the Himalaya. The steppe eagle is another example. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are the remains of steppe eagles have been found above 8,000 meters uh, on the south coal of Everest. Um, the black neck cranes that uh, spend the uh, winter months in the high valleys of Bhutan and then move to uh, Ladakh and other parts of Tibet for breeding. So you have these species that are coming back and forth across the Himalaya. There is also, of course, altitudinal migration that takes place. Um, mammals uh, like the snow leopard, in a sense, they are a liminal species. They live on that edge that is there and they move up and down with the snow line. So that in summer, as the snow line uh, retreats and rises higher, the snow leopards themselves move higher uh, and then they, they move lower uh, in winter when the snow uh, comes down to lower altitudes. They are not following the snow. What they are following, in a sense, is the prey species that they live upon, uh, the ibex, uh, the bharal, uh, the uh, markor, species of goats and sheep that the uh, snow leopard lives upon. And it is that movement, uh, that climatic change, that seasonal change, which also dictates the movement of a spectacular mammal uh, like uh, the snow leopard, which is, of course, a terrestrial species. So it is going to move with um, the uh, snow line uh, on the mountains. Um, there are so many other examples. I, I, I could give you the, uh, the masher, a fish that lives in many Himalayan, most Himalayan rivers. Uh, and in the Ganga, for instance, it uh, swims upstream during the monsoon when the tributaries and smaller feeder streams of the Ganga uh, are swollen with monsoon rain. It breeds there, uh, leaves its eggs there, uh, and then retreats back to the main river uh, as the monsoon ends. And there is that, that movement between uh, the lower reaches of the river and the upper reaches of the mountain. And one of the interesting things is the masher uh, in, in, today certainly uh, retreat down often to the bathing carts at Rishikesh. And that's where you can see them. Uh, and they, in a sense, are setting the course for many of the pilgrims who are then coming to Rishikesh, bathing there, and then traveling upriver uh, to Badrinath to 
Kedarnath, and so on. So that natural migration, in a sense, mirrors uh, a human migration or human pilgrimage. And human pilgrimage is something that, of course, is very much a part of the story of the Himalaya, of people moving up into higher regions and then moving down. We usually associate it, of course, with pastoral communities, uh, shepherds who take their flocks up to high pastures uh, in the summer and then retreat uh, down to lower pastures uh, during the winter. Uh, there are so many examples of this. There are the Gujar shepherds who take their buffaloes up to high pastures. You have the Bakarwals who take their goats and sheep up, the Gaddis who are also uh, herding uh, goats and sheep. And then in, in many parts of the Himalayas, the yak herders in Sikkim and other parts, uh, people who take the yaks uh, up to the very high pastures uh, and then descend. So there is this constant uh, movement of people uh, and animals that are, uh, in a sense, mirroring all of those other migrations that are there uh, within uh, the biological kingdom uh, that we are a part of. Um, the, uh, there is migration for agriculture as well. Many communities have higher fields and lower fields, and they move between them. They cultivate those. There is, of course, migration for employment, which is a big issue and a problem, a political issue, as well as a, a question that um, many anthropologists and sociologists have dealt with, where uh, people from the mountains have descended to the plains in order to uh, find employment and jobs. Uh, and the question is, will they return? Uh, and in many cases, you have villages that have been emptied out because of this uh, migration that is there. For me, as a writer, one of the things that I've been most fascinated with, again, is that intersection of myth uh, and science, the uh, intersection of myth and geography of sacred landscapes, uh, landscapes that are, uh, as I said before, living landscapes full of different life forms, and the way in which we as human beings have interpreted those life forms, have uh, tried to uh, make sense of that uh, wonderful diversity of life that is there in the Himalaya, and then in some cases interpreted it in spiritual and religious forms. Um, pilgrimage is so much a part of the Himalaya. And of course, the, the ultimate pilgrimage, the most sacred pilgrimage is to Mount Kailash uh, in uh, Tibet, uh, where you literally cross the Himalaya, just as the bar-headed geese and the steppe eagles cross the Himalaya. And then you go to this sacred mountain where Lord Shiva is said to sit in meditation and you uh, perform the parikrama around that mountain. I, I uh, have done that journey and it's a wonderfully uh, moving experience uh, to be able to, uh, first of all, see a mountain that uh, means so much to so many people, and then also to uh, traverse the path uh, behind it and in a sense feel that you have um, enclosed that space with your own footsteps. Uh, pilgrimage is something that uh, is uh, interpreted, experienced on so many different levels. Um, in Garhwal, we have the Chardham Yatra, where uh, pilgrims will travel up to uh, Yamnotri, Gangotri, uh, Kedarnath, and Badrinath. And um, in the old days, uh, before motor roads had come into the hills, it would take three uh, to four or five months. People would start in April, and they would complete the pilgrimage in um, October. And uh, this uh, allowed them to, first of all, see the scenic beauty of that region, but also to hear the stories that were associated with so many places along the route. And uh, um, Adi Shankaracharya uh, is credited with having, in a sense, mapped out that pilgrimage uh, to have um, uh, codified uh, that landscape uh, with the Jardham, but also the uh, Banj Kedar and the Banj Badri, other pilgrimage sites along the route. And recently, in the last couple of days, we've seen the Prime Minister uh, at Kedarnath uh, commemorating 
uh, Adi Shankaracharya's um, exploits uh, at a shrine in Kedarnath. So it is very much a part of our current discourse. It's very much a part of uh, what we are talking about today. And yet it has roots that go back to uh, Adi Shankaracharya uh, traveled through these mountains in the eighth century. So it's what is it, uh, 1400 years ago uh, that he traveled uh, there. Um, the goddesses, the local deities are also fascinating for me uh, in the sense that they are, they are outside the realm of, in a sense that homogenized Hindu um, um, storyline that is there that has been uh, laid down upon the Himalaya. The goddesses and the local deities are, are much more uh, specific to a specific region. And yet the pilgrimages that are associated with them where uh, villagers will carry a deity in the summer up uh, to her um, um, uh, summer home, uh, a temple a shrine, uh, at a higher altitude, and then in the fall, bring her down to a uh, lower shrine. Uh, with Ganga, she comes from uh, Gangotri down to Harsil. Uh, at Kedarnath, the deities are brought down from uh, Kedarnath to Ukimat. And in, in, in countless villages, there is the same uh, progression that uh, takes place. And it is often associated uh, with uh, the idea of a bride being taken to her husband's home, uh, associated, of course, with Parvati and Lord Shiv, uh, where she is taken up to this uh, desolate, hostile environment and the high Himalaya, and then she returns to her uh, mate or Maiki, her uh, mother's uh, and father's home uh, in the in the winter months. And so that mythology, that, that, that idea of uh, gender, that idea of um, sexuality, that idea of procreation, which is there in the black-necked cranes as well. The black-necked cranes are believed to uh, pair for life. Uh, they are living uh, in our human terms as a husband and wife, and they travel up into the mountains uh, to breed, uh, to nest, to lay their eggs, and then they come down to the lower valleys uh, in the winter. And it's exactly the same story of the goddess being taken to her husband's home uh, at one point of the year and then returning to her own family home at another uh, time of the year. Now, I've, I've taken quite a bit of time uh, now, and I'll, I'll, I'll just end with a couple of stories which may give you some uh, flavor of uh, the narratives, the storytelling that uh, I've used in Wild Himalaya and my other books, uh, the way in which uh, stories are embedded in the Himalayan landscape. Uh, the first example that I'll use is uh, petroglyphs in Ladakh. Uh, I encountered these maybe 10, 15 years ago for the first time, and I was fascinated by them. These are uh, stories, in a sense, etched on rocks in Ladakh. And these stories were etched by more than likely Stone Age hunters who entered the Himalaya near the time when the snow cap and the glaciers were retreating. And they entered them as hunters pursuing wild species like blue sheep, the bharal, ibex, uh, yak, wild yaks, and so on and so forth. And on these stones are these images of those animals. There are images of the hunters themselves with bows and arrows and spears. Uh, there are some images of the, the dogs that they brought with them and uh, animals like horses that they uh, used for uh, as pack animals as well. And seeing those images uh, in Ladakh, you, you suddenly get a sense that this landscape is alive with history. This is a place where people set foot uh, if not 10,000 years ago, at least 8,000 years ago, and uh, climbed up these valleys as well. And uh, those uh, images, in a sense, you have to ask yourself, why? Why did somebody carve this image? Was it to, simply to tell a story? Uh, or were they bored out of their skulls waiting for the next day's hunt? Uh, or were they uh, putting these images down for some uh, religious or shamanistic 
purpose to bless the hunt? Or was it simply a record? Uh, like in a sense, were they the first scientists who were creating uh, the first field guide uh, to Himalayan uh, mammals? We don't know, I don't have the answer, but it's fascinating when you see those, uh, those carved images on the, on the rocks. Um, hunting is of course, a very much a part of the narrative of the Himalaya. And I remember uh, when I was in Arunachal Pradesh, in Western Arunachal Pradesh, uh, I was at the Eagle Nest Wildlife Sanctuary. And uh, by happenstance, I met a, a storyteller from the Sheldukpan uh, community. And he told this wonderful story uh, around a campfire in the evening, which was about his ancestors. And the Sherdukman live in a, a sort of middle range of the Himalayas between uh, Tibet and the plains of Assam. And he said that their ancestor had been this very brave uh, hunter who knew all about the plants and herbs of the Himalayas, the animals that lived in the Himalaya. And one time he had been hunting a boar and he shot an arrow and wounded that boar. And that boar then set off and left a blood trail. And this hunter, who was the ancestor of their tribe, followed that uh, blood trail down through the mountains and, and over ridge lines, uh, through valleys, and continued down and finally ended up in the plains of Assam, where the hunter finally caught up with the boar and killed it. Now, when he killed the boar, he then uh, butchered it and cooked it. And being uh, someone who understood the herbs and uh, uh, spices of the jungle, as well as someone who possessed the salt from Tibet, he was able to cook this boar in a way that uh, was, it was a wonderful recipe. And the people of Assam, he shared uh, that feast with them. And they found this boar to be especially delicious. And they invited him to return every year. And the Sherdukpan people uh, are, traders who carry herbs and spices as well as salt from Tibet, uh, from the high Himalaya down uh, to the plains of Assam. So this gives you a sense of how uh, that ancestral story, that story of hunting, also translated into a story of trade uh, and this commerce uh, from the high Himalayas uh, down into the plains of Assam. Another story that I think is, is wonderfully evocative and full of um, a sense of migration uh, and travel is the story of Nain Singh Rawat, uh, Bandit Nain Singh Rawat, who uh, served as a, um, a sometimes referred to as a spy explorer uh, for um, colonial officers uh, in um, the Himalaya uh, at that point. Uh, white people uh, were not able to travel across the mountains. So they enlisted people from uh, communities in the Himalaya who were able to pass unnoticed across the high passes into Tibet and uh, create maps uh, and charts that uh, in a sense revealed what lay on the other side of the Himalaya. And Nain Singh Rabat is perhaps the greatest explorer. There were many others um, uh, including some of his cousins, but others from different parts of the Himalaya. But uh, Nain Singh Rawat, I think, represents this idea of traveling, again, across those mountains to see what's on the other side. He uh, helped unravel the mysteries of where the Brahmaputra River originated. And in fact, uh, that it was the Sangpo that flows through Tibet and then passes through uh, these heavily forested um, gorges in Arunachal Pradesh, and nobody could quite at that time figure out where this river began um, and where it came from. And Nain Singh Rabat helped um, um, unravel that mystery and uh, create the maps that allowed people uh, to follow uh, the route of, of that river. Um, and finally, I'll, I'll share with you a, a scientific narrative. Uh, in 1940, I believe it was 1943 or 44, uh, Salim Ali, the great uh, bird man of India, the great ornithologist, uh, traveled uh, up through Kumao uh, over the, uh, the pass into Tibet and went to uh, Mansarovar and Kailash. 
He, of course, was going as a scientist. He, he refers to this as an ornithological pilgrimage in his book, The Fall of the Sparrow. But as he describes it, he himself is a rational, um, 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 non-religious uh, scientist who is going to see where these bar-headed geese and other species uh, spend uh, the summer months. And uh, his journey essentially is a journey of scientific exploration. But when he arrives at Mansarovar, one of the first people he encounters is a man named Swami Pranavananda. And Swami Pranavananda uh, was a uh, Hindu ascetic. Uh, he had traveled up to Kalash Mansarovar more than 30 times. He had spent entire winters there. He wrote a guidebook called Kailash Mansarovar. And here you have on this um, sort of desolate uh, shores of Lake Mansarovar, this encounter between Salim Ali and uh, uh, Swami uh, Pranavananda. And one of the fascinating things about it is that these two men, one a scientist, one a uh, spiritual ascetic, uh, got along famously. Uh, and they had all sorts of things to talk about. And Salim Ali was able to explain to Pranavananda that, that the birds that he saw uh, swimming on the surface of Lake Mansarovar were not the sacred swans of mythology, but instead they were bar-headed geese who had flown across the mountains. Uh, and Pranavananda in his guidebook describes how these are not swans, but they are geese. And of course, Thanks to Salim Ali, he can also provide the information that they are entirely vegetarian. So you have these wonderful stories of people who have crossed the mountains, of different species who have crossed the mountains, of uh, different aspects of the mountains that are constantly moving back and forth uh, and in interaction with other species. And I think that that to me is the most exciting part of the Himalayan story that it is not just one story, but it is in a sense, a multitude of stories. It is a mountain range of stories uh, that are there for us to experience, to hear, to read, uh, and to explore. So at that point, I'll, I'll stop. I think I've taken my time, but thank you all very much for your attention. I hope I haven't put anyone to sleep. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen, for that wonderful talk. And I um, really like the way you uh, kind of talked about migration. You know, I never, I, uh, you know, we always, you know, witness migration, we learn about migration, but the way you put it, you know, how that cycle uh, is going on with, uh, uh, you know, the flora, the fauna, the people, and that really caught my attention. And I really want to pose this question to you that when we talk about migration and now with, you know, um, all the threats that we are facing um, um, and particularly sustainability and all these things that are happening in the Himalayas with these dams and this change and change which may, may not be necessarily good for all of us, what do you uh, see in the future? You know, you have grown up in the mountains. You have seen change firsthand. So what would you say about all of that? Um, I would love to hear your uh, point of view. Right. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I consciously this evening decided to stay away from the, the, the more depressing aspects of these stories, uh, in a sense, the destructive forces. I mean, we, we hear about it all the time. And I could, I could speak for another hour on, on that subject, whether it's uh, the, the, uh, um, the, the dangers of large dams, whether it's uh, the effects of erosion, which are caused by uncontrolled uh, construction and so on and so forth. But I, th I think what I, would, what I would say is, and, and thank you for asking that question because it's, it's absolutely vital uh, to the future of the Himalaya, is that if we can understand uh, in a sense this um, constant uh, movement that is there in the Himalaya, this constant change, and recognize that we as human beings should do as little as possible to accelerate that change. To, change, uh, to, to sort of put our foot on the accelerator in a sense, um, whether it's uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the use of carbon fuels, uh, creation of 
greenhouse gases and so on and so forth that are are leading to the melting of glaciers, are leading to the loss of snowcap and so on and so forth. I mean, we're accelerating that process. And um, th then our interventions on so many levels, whether it's building um, dams, whether it's building roads, whether it's building uh, uncontrolled uh, um, hotels and ashrams for religious tourism, all of these things are contributing to, uh, in a sense, a, an accelerated change in the Himalaya. And that I think is, is dangerous. I think it needs to be controlled. It, it, first of all, before it needs to be controlled, it needs to be understood. And I think scientists are trying to understand it. Uh, we don't have all the answers, um, but at the same time, we must find those answers. We must find them soon and we must find solutions quickly. Thank you, Stephen. And I'm really glad, you know, you talked about myths and all of that, because I do this field school, uh, which is called myth and reality and materiality and memory. And I feel that uh, these two aspects are so important in understanding how nature works and how everything is woven around, uh, you know, nature and myth making and why it is the way it is. Why are those stories in place? There is a reason. And uh, the fact that you highlighted, um, you know, the uh, procession of the goddesses, you know, going with the summer home, the winter home and all of that, it has reason. So I'm glad um, you, you talked about these things, which are so, so important for anybody who wants to understand the Himalayas better. And um, at this point, I will urge uh, others to raise their hands and uh, pose questions to Stephen. Uh, this has been so nice. You know, you're one of my favorite authors and to see you uh, live. It's really, I'm, I'm so happy today. Abhimanyu, uh, he's a... Uh, um, an anthropologist. Uh, he's studying to be, uh, he's doing his dissertation. And um, he's also Siddharth Pandey's brother. So uh, Abhimanyu, uh, I'll take your question first. Uh, and then we will have to Hina Ray after him. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for this introduction. Uh, thank you, uh, Stephen Ji, for this wonderful, wonderful talk. And uh, my question is something I mentioned in the chat as well. Uh, it was that, uh, can you please cite the source of the conversation or the interaction between Dr. Salim Ali and Swami Pranavananda? Because I would be very interested in reading that. I was in, like I worked in the region around Mount Kailash for a few years in the past. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Well, uh, yes, uh, you can find the story uh, in, um... Salim Ali's autobiography, uh, Fall of the Sparrow. Uh, it's, um, he has a whole chapter in which, in fact, he, he uses all of his notebooks from that journey and he extracts uh, passages from the, uh, those excerpts. And it's, it's a wonderful part of that book. And I, I recommend it highly for anyone who's interested in uh, the Himalaya, but also that uh, pilgrimage, because he, um, he has a wonderful sense of humor uh, and he tells his stories with great gusto. Uh, Pranavananda's uh, Kailash Mansarovar doesn't directly refer to Salim Ali, but uh, if you look through it, there are certain points, as I mentioned, when he, when he tells us that the, uh, the, the sacred swans are actually bar-headed geese, and in fact, they are vegetarian, uh, that's, that's very much there. And, and uh, to my mind, there's no doubt that that came out of his conversations with Salim Ali. Thank you very much, sir. All the best, yes. Thank you, Abhimanyu. Uh, we have Tuhina uh, after um, Abhimanyu now. Tuhina, over to you. A very good evening to you, sir. Good evening. And uh, thank you so much for this amazing talk. I am just a mountain lover and uh, you know, I just uh, read one of your books uh, and uh, it was amazing read. My one and only question to you, what has been your most fulfilling experience uh, while staying with the mountains? Um, well, gosh, that's, that's a tough one. Uh, I think <laughs> there are so many experiences that were fulfilling and moving and uh, important over the years. Uh, I think that... Uh, you know, my journey to Mount Kailash was important, uh, partly because it's such an iconic 
uh, mountain. It's not actually part of the Himalaya itself. In fact, it's in the Trans-Himalayan region. Uh, and yet, nevertheless, it's so, so integral to the Himalayan story. So that, that was certainly a part of it. But I think that you know, there are many moments uh, that I've experienced uh, very close to home here. We have uh, near my home is uh, the Jebrakeith Nature Reserve, where I uh, tend to take a walk at least two or three times a week. And um, there are so many things that I've observed uh, simply on an afternoon walk there that uh, have given me a sense of um, a profound appreciation for the biodiversity of the Himalaya, whether it was uh, coming upon a goral, uh, a goat antelope uh, that I surprised on my walk. And he, he and I both were equally surprised uh, when we came face to face with each other, or uh, whether it's seeing green pigeons uh, roosting in the trees or you know, or even just a butterfly uh, uh, on a leaf there. Those little moments, uh, those uh, moments of chance that you encounter uh, in the Himalaya are sometimes equally profound um, and equally meaningful. Thank, Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Thank you so Nina. much for the question. Thank you so much. Yeah. So over to uh, Dave for his question, and then I'll take Siddharth's question. Hi, good evening. It was great listening to what you had to say, and it was amazing. And uh, I just have one question about, say, prehistory of the Himalayas, as far as religion goes. Because in the area where I'm from, in the Kulu Valley, shamanism is much more entrenched than the Ram, Lakshman, Shiva, and this type of Hinduism, even though the, and then like when you go to Tibet, there's shamanism there too. So is shamanism like the precursor to modern religion in the Himalayas is my question. Well, I think shamanism is, is there throughout the mountains and there are different versions of it. Uh, the, you know, the Bon tradition in Tibet, uh, in um, um, Arunachal Pradesh, there are, traditions of shamanism that are part of a sort of animistic faith. And I've always been fascinated by that because I think that in a sense, it points back to some of the origins of, of religion uh, where, um, you know, we, we now tend to think of uh, religion in this uh, very uh, formal um, codified uh, scriptural uh, sense and, and politically We've been pushed in that direction. Uh, those who are the interpreters of religion and in a sense the purveyors of religion uh, have also pushed us in, in that direction. Whereas the, the shamanistic traditions are much more raw. Uh, they are much closer to uh, nature uh, in, on, on so many levels. And for me, that, that is fascinating. I mean, in a sense, because I like to think, I, I often ask myself, well, where did all of this, uh, where did religion come from? I myself uh, am an atheist, but I often uh, say that I'm a lapsed atheist because I'm fascinated with uh, religion. I'm fascinated with uh, mythology and, and scripture. And, and from a position of atheism, I'm able to, in a sense, explore those religious experiences without have been uh, sort of attached to one or another tradition. And one of the things that I've often found is that um, there, there's an experience in nature and there's an experience in the mountains, which is um, something that is common to many of us. Uh, any of us who have trekked through the mountains have often stood at a place where there was a spectacular view uh, and we were overawed by that landscape. Uh, and at the same time, we were standing on a precipice where if we looked down below our feet, the mountains fell away into a chasm that aroused a sense of fear and, and terror in us. And I've often thought that uh, it is that experience of the sublime, um, which I've written about in, in Becoming a Mountain, is that experience of the sublime, where on one level, it, you are looking at, with wonder at uh, 
the the sort of marvelous uh, manifestation of creation. And at the same time, you're looking down below your feet and you're absolutely shit scared that you're going to fall over and die. And I think that is the moment that, in a sense, is the essence of most religious experience. And shamans, in a sense, picked that up to begin with. They took what we were afraid of and they would took what we were in awe of, and they were able to wind those two things together and create a narrative that in a sense gave us a sense of something larger than ourselves, something bigger than ourselves. And over time, uh, I think religion has sort of wound that ball into a bigger and bigger and more complex, and in a sense, sadly, a more homogenous uh, narrative over time. So that's that's my two cents on religion. I I, I don't want to sound like some uh, Himalayan guru who's uh, giving you all the answers from here, but I do think that moment when you're standing on the edge is something that uh, takes us very close to the origins uh, of uh, religious faith. And I would Thank you like so much. Dev, I would like to add, uh, you know, uh, my own research is on shamanism in the Himalayas. And uh, two months ago, I gave a talk with Flinders University on that. So, um, um, but I address it in um, a very material uh, manner, um, a material culture based. So um, down the future, when, when I do publish, whenever I do, uh, I will uh, make sure that we do a talk here as well. And of course, it's so important to learn about different uh, strands of um, understanding of shamanism. I don't want to say like the word shamanism itself, I got trolled for it when I when I was giving this talk, somebody on Facebook of all places, you know, Facebook, um, uh, somebody wrote, oh, how can you uh, use this word and all of that? But um, uh, some people don't understand the sense of what it is. Uh, in terms of how do you relate pre-religion, pre-organized religion, if you know that word comes closest to it. And of course, like Stephen said, uh, it, it different parts of the Himalayas have different versions of it. Um, and uh, it's, it's, uh, they're so close to nature. And now because of this whole Sanskritization that happened over a large, uh, huge period of time, so many changes happened that it's very difficult to separate one from the other. But you do see these, uh, you know, uh, specks here and there, uh, which uh, take us back to those origins. And it's just about uh, understanding and we may never get to the truth, but nearer to the truth at least. So over to uh, Siddharth for his question and then I'll take Krishna's question. Hello again, Stephen, I hope you can hear me. Yeah, yes. thank you. Thank you so much, both to you and Sonali. It was so such a pleasure and I must say, I think Sonali will agree with this, that it was such a pleasure to just, you know, uh, hear this as a kind of a follow-up talk to my talk from the last uh, last uh, uh, last Sunday because everything that you spoke virtually every single thing from mythology to movement to the uh, the impermanence of mountains is something that I was also trying to preface within my own talk and it's just so lovely to to have this sort of confluence of ideas at, at you know through through your work so thank you so much for for this as you were speaking the sheer lyricism of your uh, of your presentation was reminding me of uh, you know Frank Smythe's work works and Robert McFarlane's work. So all of those ideas again coming together within the context of our beloved Himalayas was just beautiful and I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. My only question here is that because you have been working on the Himalayas and writing so extensively on them, um, it's, it's more from a writer's and craft perspective. Uh, because, um, like, you know, I, I, I experienced this myself when I was doing my PhD at Cambridge that once you start working on something and there's so much material one amasses over the over the years that you decide on a topic and then 10 other topics also sort of, you know, grow out of the, your basic material. And I'm sure you would have encountered something like that. Too. So the only question, the very basic question is how do you then apportion, you know, the kind of wealth of information that you amass by staying and traveling within one particular region? And, and decide on that, all right, now you will write, first you will write this book and second you will write this book or do you begin some several projects at the same time or simultaneously? It's an interesting, very interesting question. And as, as I think I said earlier, I mean, the Himalaya are this limitless, this <laughs> yeah. virtually eternal library that is yeah. full of stories, full of texts, full of things. I mean, you could write a book about every 
single um, aspect of the Himalaya, and then you never uh, come to an end. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's a it, it's a huge problem. I think for me uh, as a writer, what I tend to do is uh, I I can focus it and limit it through my own experiences. So where I go, uh, where I travel, where I choose to visit, in a sense, dictates what I choose to tell. Uh, because I think for me, it's, uh, you know, I can write about things that I've read about in books, but I would much rather see something for myself or hear something for myself and then be able to relate it to things that I saw in books. I, I tend to start with my personal experience uh, and then build upon that rather than begin with a, something I found in a book and then go in search of that in the mountains. Uh, I often talk about, um, and I've, uh, there's a chapter in Becoming a Mountain called Writing with My Feet. Yes. Uh, and that whole idea is that uh, as a writer uh, who travels and generally travels on foot, um, I'm making the choices as I'm moving through the mountains. So if I come to a fork in the road, I, I make a choice. Uh, it, it'll be more interesting if I go to the left rather than the right, because I know where the path to the right leads, where I'm not quite sure where the path to the left goes. I may get lost. Yeah. Uh, I may end up in the wrong place, whatever it may be. But in a sense, as a writer, you, you, you create the first draft of what you're writing through the choices you make in your journeys. Uh, and so that's very much my personal approach to it. And I think that allows me to limit um, uh, what I um, write about. So, uh, you know, if there's a part of the mountains I haven't visited, I I'll tend to save that for another book. Indeed. Thank you so much. It was a lovely answer. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Siddharth. And uh, Dr. Kapila wants to uh, uh, say something, uh, Stephen. Hi. Hi, Stephen. Hi. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk. And you know, your story about the descent of the Ganga and her travel to her natal home in Harsil Mukba really gives me, uh, you know, I, I want to sing a song that totally illustrates that. It's so beautiful. Can I sing a few lines? Hmm? Of course. Of course. Ganga meri pyari ma Bhagavati tu dhani vajaya Bhagirat raja nama ta teri tapasya kari Swark biti lai ma Bhagavati tu dhani vajaya so here, you know, exactly what Stephen talked about, the descent of the river and Bhagirat's uh, penance for the salvation of 60,000 and then uh, Ganga comes down, descends into the locks of Shiva. See how beautifully they actually, you know, they, they are so proud to own Ganga. They say that she belongs to us because that is her natal home as she comes in the winter months from uh, Gangotri to And so thank you so much, uh, Stephen, for this narrative and this lovely story. I thought I should just share with you as I traveled along the river for 350 kilometers, I heard the voices of the people. And like you, I would like to say to Siddharth that I also base my work more on the voices of the people and their traditional wisdom and inherent knowledge. And rather than just looking at so many books on, on the Himalayas. So, you know, a lot of the a lot of the narrative and the work that comes comes from their wisdom and their voices. And then I try to weave that into any other thing that I have read about. So I really, I really relate to your work and understand the way you write too. Thank you so much. Well, uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, those <clears throat> phrases from the song. And uh, I think it, those songs are what uh, bring many of these stories to life. Uh, in so so many ways. I think one of the fascinating things about the descent of the Ganga is that, of course, it is a Himalayan myth, uh, but at the same time, it is a pan-Indian myth. And if you go to yeah. Mahabalipuram, uh, south of Chennai, about as far away from the Himalayas as you can get in India, there is that rock sculpture on the beach, which is the descent of the Ganga. And yeah. it's such a wonderful, spectacular image um, there's a there's a sort of natural fault in the rock, which is where during the monsoon the water will flow down, and all around it are the gods and the deities, the animals, the elephants, and everything that have uh, 
gathered uh, to celebrate uh, the descent of the Ganga and King Bhagirath is there also uh, doing his tapasya. So I think it's 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 a very potent uh, myth. It's a story that uh, has obviously traveled throughout the subcontinent, and it's something that um, is is very much uh, a part of not just Himalayan uh, tradition, but also mm-hmm. a Pan-Indian uh, tradition as well. Yeah, and yeah. I would Thank like to so add. Much. Uh, you know, coming from the descent of the Ganges that we are talking, it's not only in art and these myths that we see it, even in uh, how it is ritualized. So if you go to a Shiva temple, uh, especially in the Kulu Valley, uh, you uh, circumambulate it anti-clockwise, not clockwise as in other temples, and you stop at the Makarmuk, which is the outlet from where the water which is poured on the Shiva Linga uh, is released, because that is kind of, your uh, you don't cross it because that is from where the Ganga flows. That's what the locals say, that you cannot uh, 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 cross over because that is uh, uh, the most um, uh, horrible thing to do. You're crossing over the head of Shiva and going across the Ganga. So you have to go back again and then complete the circle in a semicircular kind of uh, fashion. So you go anti-clockwise, stop, and then you come back again. So the whole myth is also ritualized in this odd circumambulatory uh, um, positioning that people take. So, which is very fascinating to me. No, that's fascinating. I haven't heard heard that sort of ritual, but it 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 sort of fits in with so much of the narrative. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. Exactly. So do we have any other questions? Uh, I knew Krishna had a question and then um, um, he or she lowered their hand. So, um, I can just okay. open, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, am I audible? Yes. 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 Yeah. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Stephen, uh, I mean, uh, that was fascinating and uh, I consider myself very privileged and honored to hear you talk. I'm familiar with your work and I've read your books, but I never imagined that I would ever be able to, uh, you know, like hear you or see you even if it's uh, in the virtual domain so uh, i uh, you know i have two questions you know, one is uh, uh, with regard to uh, the livelihoods um, of the people you know what you um, you know the kind of livelihood livelihoods people were involved in uh, historically and the kind of changes that have happened in your part of himalaya in masuri there are and elsewhere as well. And the second question, I, I actually I was hesitating, but I might as well ask because it's a kind of a comparative question. Uh, question and comparisons can be odious, but uh, here it goes nevertheless. So, do you think, uh, as far as uh, the, I, I would imagine there are two, uh, I mean, dominant cultures in the Himalayas. I mean, uh, there is the Buddhist culture uh, and there is the Hindu culture. And somewhere uh, in your view, uh, do you see uh, a kind of a difference in the way, you know, uh, people who are Buddhist? Uh, and I also re- uh, uh, realize from what little I visited of Himalayas, the, the dividing line again is not very uh, firm, you know, it's kind of, Uh, goes both ways. But nevertheless, uh, are there any difference in the way, uh, I mean, does uh, religion, faith have uh, some perceptible difference to the way uh, people, you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, interface with their environment, uh, their ecology? Um, I I don't know. I, I, I kind of had this doubt uh, in my visits to the Himalayas. Uh, so uh, I was just wondering if, if uh, is there any uh, perceptible difference in the way, uh, you know, the Buddhist uh, and they, the way they interface and the way the Hindus uh, interface. Sure. And, uh, 
Yeah, well, I can I can try to that. Uh, let me try to answer your second question first, and then I can come back to livelihoods after that. I mean, obviously, yes, there are differences. I mean, there's no question about it. Uh, if you if you visit a uh, Buddhist uh, temple or monastery or pilgrimage site, uh, there are obvious iconography is different. Uh, there are different stories attached to it uh, than there are to uh, some of the um, Hindu sites, uh, temples. Uh, uh, pilgrimage sites there as well, obviously, and and the stories are different uh, in in many ways. But one of the fascinating things is the confluence of narratives as well. Um, uh, so Nadi was talking about uh, how in uh, Himachal Pradesh uh, you will circumambulate uh, the Shiv uh, shrine um, counterclockwise, but then stop and then. Uh, turn around and go clockwise. When you uh, circumambulate Kailash, when you go on the Kailash Kora or the uh, Parikrama, uh, Buddhists and Hindus will go clockwise. So you'll start uh, at the foot of the mountain and then you'll move to your left and circle around the mountain. And that is how you complete the circ uh, circumambulation. Whereas the Bon tradition, the people of the uh, shamanistic uh, the older tradition in, in Tibet, which has to a very large extent been subsumed by uh, Buddhism, um, Tibetan Buddhism, uh, they circumambulate the mountain counterclockwise. So when you're doing the pilgrimage, what's fascinating, you have Buddhists and Hindu pilgrims going this direction, and then you encounter Bon pilgrims coming the other direction, and you greet each other. Um, there's a there's no conflict uh, there at all. But what's fascinating is the way in which the narratives that lead to that route uh, or to that orientation uh, are different. I mean, the bonds uh, say that at some point uh, the, 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 there was a, a great shaman that was uh, circumambulating Kailash and the pilgrims tried to catch up with him and they couldn't catch up with him. And so they decided to turn around and go the other way and confront him as he was coming uh, in the opposite direction. So that's, that's in a sense, a very simplistic version of uh, that orientation or that route that is followed. Uh, but even at Kailash, you have so many wonderful um, intersections between Buddhist tradition and uh, Hindu tradition. There is there is, in a sense, a conflict and there's a competition that is going on there as well. But in a sense, over time also, there's been a convergence of stories there so that the, um, the, the, the physical uh, features of that mountain are all interpreted. In one case, there's a, there's a scar on the front of the mountain that is obviously uh, from erosion. And it's said that that is the mark left by the shaman's drum uh, as he was uh, cast down the mountain by uh, Milarepa, who, who uh, had a competition with him at that point. So that becomes the Bon and the, the Buddhist thing. And on the other hand, you have uh, this cornice of snow that is right up at the top of the mountain. And that is referred to by uh, Hindu pilgrims as the Sheshnag uh, that uh, shelters Lord Shiv in meditation on the mountain. And, and so many others of these. And what, what I find fascinating is that for the most part, these stories coexist. These stories don't uh, conflict with each other. Of course, uh, if we go back to history when um, Adi Shankaracharya came to map out these mountains. Part of his project was to take back the mountains for a Brahmanical Hinduism uh, because they had been, in a sense, occupied by Buddhist tradition. So th there was a conflict back in the eighth century. But uh, for the most part, uh, when I've traveled through the mountains, um, th there's been a level of coexistence in terms of the uh, various traditions, not just Hindu and Buddhist, but uh, Jain, Bon, other uh, traditions, the Sikh tradition, if you go to Hemkund Sab in Garhwal, that's a whole different pilgrimage, it's a whole different tradition, uh, and yet it coexists within, uh, I think fortunately the Himalaya are expansive enough and big enough that everybody can choose their uh, sacred spots uh, without too often uh, treading on each other's toes.
Uh, just very briefly in terms of livelihoods, I think that um, um, livelihoods have changed dramatically in the Himalaya. And uh, COVID itself, I think, is probably going to, I, I don't want to make a prediction, but I think COVID, because it has restricted the movement of people up and down uh, the mountains, is, is perhaps going to put, if not the final full stop to past, some pastoral communities, I think it's going to diminish uh, their um, migration to a very, very large extent. And uh, it's, it's, I think, an unfortunate situation, but at the same time, uh, perhaps inevitable. At some point, pastoral communities were going to have to uh, scale back uh, their livelihood through uh, livestock and um, uh, shepherding and all of that. And COVID has has really uh, put a stop to that uh, in the last two years. But at the same time, because of COVID in the rest of the nation being very strong, lots and lots of people have moved up to the Himalayas where movement is yet not as restricted and you can go out of your backyard and be in the mountains. And lots of people have moved up into the Kulu area and like you can't find an apartment for nothing. But there's hotels that are empty. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I think that that migration is another whole trend. But you're absolutely right. I think that uh, you, you know the Himalaya have been a refuge for many people during during the COVID uh, pandemic. Thank you, Stephen. Abhimanyu has another question. I hope um, time is not an issue right now. Yeah. Okay. And then Thank I'll you. take Rajoli uh, after that. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, uh, Stephen, sir, I have this uh, question regarding tourism in the Himalayas. I mean, you have spent all your life in the Himalayas and that you would have also uh, observed how over the last four or five decades, Himalayan tourism has also exponentially grown like people from all over the world and now increasingly so in majority from India itself various parts of India, they visit the Himalayas in the summers and now increasingly in the winters as well. So, and tourism as it has also been seen affects or it acts as a cultural, a force of cultural change as well as environmental change in the uh, Himalayas. I would like to have your perspective on whether you view tourism as a positive force or a negative force or some or you have a different kind of a take on the kind of role tourism at present plays and can potentially play in the future. Thank you. Sure. Well, I think, you know, those of us that live in the Himalaya have a sort of um, instinctual or reflexive um, resistance to the idea of tourism simply because it, it we see it often as an intrusive um, uh, force in the mountains. But I think we also, all of us, recognize that it is one of the uh, primary sources of uh, income for many people in the Himalaya. Uh, it is uh, vital to um, uh, hill stations. It's vital to pilgrimage centers. It's vital to um, so many different uh, areas of the Himalaya where um, that have attractive people from other parts of India and other parts of the world. So I, I'm not somebody who um, is opposed to tourism. What I do feel very strongly about is that tourism needs to be very carefully planned and regulated, and the numbers have to be reduced. Uh, there's, 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 you know, there's this constant refrain. Uh, from politicians, from tour operators, from uh, hoteliers and others that, you know, this year we had, uh, you know, 50 lakh tourists coming to Uttarakhand. I, that's a number I pulled out of a hat. But uh, next year we must have 75 and so on and so forth. Uh, that, that I think is, is short-sighted, foolish, and, and really ultimately self-destructive. What we need to be able to do is say how much, how many people can these um, places, uh, you know, welcome and welcome in a responsible manner. Uh, anyone who has been stuck in a traffic jam on the road to Gangotri will know that it is a completely absurd situation that you have so many thousands of people pouring into that area 
on a day. And we're not really prepared to house them. We're not prepared to feed them. We're not prepared to give them sanitation and things like that. So uh, my, my short answer to your question is, yes, tourism is a great thing um, for many people. Uh, and I welcome it. But let's control it. Let's get it uh, into some sort of reasonable uh, scale that uh, will not destroy the mountains and will preserve that very thing that these people are coming to see. Because if we don't do that, then that 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 scenic beauty, uh, that pristine environment, uh, that clean air, uh, whatever it may be that they're after, or that spiritual sanctity is is no longer going to exist. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And I think it also defeats the very purpose of this whole thing about the sacred journey, the artist journey. You know, you make these four lanes and the artist journey, of course, it is convenient, but that at what cost? It's destroying the scenery um, development like no other. The place I am in, you know, there was, uh, they just cut uh, the uh, highway uh, through these apple orchards. And uh, with during the pandemic, so much of development took place, concrete structures, uh, unbridled uh, kind of uh, construction activity uh, during the pandemic, and it's become an eyesore now. So it's really sad that uh, aesthetics are not in, taken into account. The whole idea of the sacred is kind of abandoned by um, just spoiling the view, the scene and the experience. So, um, you know, if there are no mountains and there is, uh, where will the experience go, the sacred and the spiritual experience that you just talked about? So um, we will take um, um, Rajoli's question. Rajoli. Uh, good evening, ma'am, and good evening, sir. Uh, sir, I would like to, uh, first of all, thank you for giving such a great talk. And um, I'm just, I just feel honored uh, to be here and to listen to you. Uh, so so uh, for your uh, talk today, you spoke about uh, how uh, the Mashir fish, uh, you know, retreats back and up the stream and also uh, how the human pilgrimage also sort of follows through it. So uh, my question to you is uh, how uh, this culture of pilgrimage and ecology, how these two dimensions are intertwined. And uh, with the current rate of uh, so many changes happening uh, in terms of geology, also uh, other forces, how do you see this uh, uh, go forward in the future? I mean, how, how such traditions with respect to environment and culture might uh, have a change? Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you uh, for the question. I, I don't necessarily have all the answers to that, but I guess what I would, would reflect on is that those migrations that occur within nature, for the most part, are a part of nature's um, recreating itself, sustaining itself, uh, perpetuating life, uh, perpetuating a species, uh, perpetuating the relationships between different species. So when a masher uh, swims upstream and lays its eggs, it is uh, continuing uh, the existence of its own species, uh, but it is also obviously contributing to other species that may feed upon those eggs, uh, other species that may um, be part of that same environment. And similarly, uh, when the black neck cranes fly across the mountains and lay their eggs in Tibet and then return to Bhutan, all of that is a, um, what's the word, um, a, a sort of self-preserving, uh, a self-continuing, uh, a positive uh, force of creation. And we as human beings have, have in a sense, mimicked those journeys. We have uh, followed those journeys in our pilgrimages. We followed those journeys in, in other ways as well, not just in the religious uh, way, but uh, whether we're mountaineers, whether we're explorers, whatever it is. And I think that as human beings that are, in a sense, retracing those journeys from nature, whether we go upstream in a river, 
uh, and then uh, ride a kayak or a river raft or whatever it is downstream, which is what we uh, do for our adventure and enjoyment and all of that. We must remember at every point that uh, these should be journeys that sustain, uh, protect, and conserve that environment, because ultimately that's, that's in a sense, the inspiration uh, that is um, driving us on those journeys. And in a sense, it should not be something that exploits, uh, degrades, or uh, destroys that environment, but instead contributes to it and makes it uh, somehow better, more whole, and more vibrant in that way. So uh, I, I, there are many, many uh, dimensions to this. It, you know, there are many aspects of um, the, from science that I could uh, perhaps wander into, but I'd probably get myself tangled up in an answer there. But very simply, uh, as we follow the journeys that are there in nature itself, we should uh, work in concert with nature. We should be a part of nature and we should always strive uh, to sustain uh, that environment that we are enjoying uh, and appreciating uh, through our own journeys. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the lovely answer. Thank you. Thank you, Rajoli. And I, I do believe what Stephen says, be a part of it, not apart from it, a uh, part of nature, not a part. Uh, and with that, uh, we'll draw this talk to an end. Um, and uh, so many, uh, so much of insight from your talks on, uh, you know, va various uh, themes that you covered today on the Himalayas. And uh, I, I hope all of us who are here, you know, we uh, take all of this and kind of uh, think about it and try to make that change from within and understanding nature and uh, follow what it really wants us to do. And Stephen, we have this tradition here that you leave the audience with some words of wisdom. And before you do that, I would urge all of you who have come here for the first time, uh, please do attend uh, our talks every Sunday at 7 p.m. Indian Standard Time. Next week, we have Shen Pen Khamsar, who's a filmmaker, comes from a family of Rinpoche's from Darjeeling. And uh, he made the first film uh, after 72 years in Darjeeling. So uh, he will be talking about his writing, his music, uh, about the Himalayas and how it was growing up. So you could all join us next week for that. Um, and Stephen, over to you for your words of wisdom. Gosh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss for words of wisdom, but all I would say is that I hope uh, that all of you uh, in each of your separate ways can uh, understand, appreciate, uh, and experience the Himalaya in all its diversity, and uh, that it should be a landscape that never disappoints you, uh, and uh, the experiences, the observations that you find there will never be uh, exhausted. So uh, please uh, visit the Himalaya, enjoy them, and uh, learn from them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephen. Stephen. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you, Stephen. And we Absolutely hope to have wonderful. you back with, uh, with, you know, soon with more and more insights. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you all very much. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye.